Are there any uh, changes or additions to the agenda as presented? I've got a couple additions. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I want to briefly review the lease for the apartment above the Holcomb House. Okay. Uh, and uh, I want to bring the board to speed on uh, revolving loan fund application that John has promised is putting in. And okay. uh, I believe Doug has something on. Uh, Go ahead, Doug. Uh, you're on mute, Doug. All right. Um, I assume I am off mute. Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, I want to bring up the uh, if the trustees approve the uh, installation of the ladder for fishing on the Lamoille at the Talc Mill, which is uh, probably going to be on their agenda next week, that, that we might, uh, you know, uh, follow, give our approval beforehand, and I'll explain why. Uh, Okay, comes up. Yeah, I see Kyle has now joined. Are there any other additions or changes to the agenda? Uh, the other, the other thing with regard to fishing access is the uh, the access that we have uh, from David Butler uh, is uh, is kind of parallel to the one on the the talc mill. The same issue. So I want to address that also. Okay. If no one's got anything else. Is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes for May 4th and May 15th? So move, Mr. Chairman. We got a motion. We have a second. I can, you're going to have to unmute yourself, Nat. Uh, he, uh, I've got to unmute. Oh. Can you unmute all the board members? Yes. Please? Okay. Second the motion. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'm gonna abstain from the last meeting minutes because I was not there. So um, the 18th, I believe. Okay. So Donna so notes that uh, Carl is recusing herself from the 18th. Any other discussion? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? And now, Rosemary, you've got the floor. Unmute. Okay, go ahead, Rosemary. Okay, um, I sent out the current budget status report, and to date, we're 80% spent a budget. And revenue is at Isn't that like ninety eight percent. Yes. Almost. And I sent out uh, warrants in the amount of $20,359.72. And we would be looking for a motion authorizing a board member to sign on behalf of the board? Yes. What's, what's the board's pleasure there? Move to authorize Eric to sign on the board's behalf. Second. That motion is second, any more discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? I'll probably stop by tomorrow. Okay. Um, currently, I have 15 people are asking for an abatements of the penalty and interest. I'm not sure if that's something you guys want to do at your next board meeting. Because the legislature has given the select board's authority to do that now. Oh, without a BCA? Yes. Oh, Board of Abatement. Okay, what's well, Board's pleasure? Next meeting. Okay, then that's all that I had. Great. Anybody got any questions from Rosemary? 
Hearing none, seeing none. We have no highway report. Or uh, I guess, Brian, it goes into your report. Okay. So I'm going to get started with our. Um, let's see. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mike. I like uh, Brian, maybe could fill in for uh, Brian Krause on the uh, grader. I'd like to hear a little more on the grader. Oh, yeah. Maybe bring us up to speed on that, if you could, Brian. Yeah. So the greater, uh, the transmission on the greater has broken down. So we are uh, pursuing getting that repaired. Uh, it's estimated to take about two weeks for us to complete the repairs. Uh, we are completing them in shop, bringing in a qualified John Deere mechanic, um, local guy, Lahulier, can't remember his first name. Um, right. Yes, Rick Lulier uh, is coming in and doing it. Um, and we expect about two weeks total transition time before it's back on the road. Um, it, the cost is going to be, you know, thirty to forty thousand dollars, and uh, a lot of that's parts, um, but time and parts. Uh, and one of our guys is going to be devoted to. You know, mechanic for the, the all that time too. Do we uh, expect that kind of an expense to be a uh, real hitter on our budget for the end of the year? I expect we're going to be able to afford it, but it is going to. We don't have that kind of space dedicated to that line, either, so we're going to have to. Um, it's going to impact some of the things. It might impact some of our paving that we had planned on, um, or it's going to impact some of it. But uh, that is something that we're working on. Yeah, it, it, is that invoice going to be a uh, this fiscal year or next year fiscal year? Uh, it'll be this fiscal year. We okay. asked for our net thirty to pay it if we uh, felt that necessary, but I don't think that's necessary. Okay. Uh, likewise, I don't think it's, um, you know, I think that we're pretty confident on the two weeks. Uh, Ray has asked for a little bit of time off. Uh, so I think that combined, we're okay for not bringing the greater in right away. We've talked to Hyde Park. Um, so if we need them, they'll be able to uh, help us out with grading. They are going to be doing, I believe, what can Island Road for us? Okay. Because that's kind of the, that needs it right now. That was our uh, our next, we start staging gravel on, on what can Island getting ready to take back of um, We're going to try and work a couple other spots with the disker on the tractor when that comes in. So we're hoping to have a uh, yeah, we're hoping that we'll be able to weather this one, but we'll lean on the uh, neighboring company usually if we have need of an emergency situation. Now was that just normal wear and tear? Uh more or less, we had installed a rebuilt one a while ago, I believe. I know that Ray has complained that the uh, transmission wasn't in good shape. Um, so he kind of knew it was maybe not ready to break like this, but uh, yeah, it appears to be more or less normal wear and tear. When's that slated to be uh, swapped? Uh, 2023. Okay. It didn't really help that we're grading such hard roads too. Had they been uh, graded earlier this year when they were softer, they wouldn't have been quite as much wear and tear on the grading. But you know, we don't put a lot of wear and tear on that grader. You know, when you think about 
uh, some towns or we used to years ago put a wing on it and uh, wing back the snow and run it you know year round and we don't do that we haven't done that for years I don't see why that thing the transmission's not holding up well it might be time to look into a different brand next time too you know yeah but yeah, uh, we're definitely going to do uh, pretty wide evaluation when it, it comes due again. Uh, okay. Anybody got any other further questions on the with reference to the grader? That repair comes out of the reserve fund, right? No, it does no. not. Our operating fund. It does. The reserve fund is only for the purchase of equipment. Well, uh, I thought so. you could do maintenance there too. That's too bad. Would uh, would Rick LaHulier be in a position to report to us on what uh, condition, you know, what went wrong and what the likelihood of the, the period of uh, a repair would be good for? Things like that. Is there something to learn from the mechanic? I'll ask him if uh, he would like to appear before us or if he can brief Brian on it for when Brian's here at our um, June 15th meeting. Well, I wouldn't threaten him with being interrogated by Mike, but Brian might work. <laughs> As a, he, he might, I mean, he may or may not want to come to an evening meeting, or we might have to pay him his, uh, his rate. And, uh, his rate is not cheap. Well, that's true. Yeah. yeah I like your uh, comment you had, Doug. Uh, if we get an evaluation from him, he probably doesn't even have to come here. He right, I agree. He idea what he thinks about it. And if he thinks it's uh, going to uh, crap the bed again right off, and we might move that up and get rid of it sooner. Well, I think a report on what we're facing of brass tax would be good. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a good thing to think about to yeah. maybe replace it a lot sooner. Brian, could you ask Brian Krause to yeah to talk to him and have a report for our next meeting? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so the first item up on the my report is uh, talking about facility use and updating the uh, forms and fees. This is something that we've tossed around a couple times. That you know maybe we should look at um, fees for. Uh, for managing the, sorry, I think I'll pull this up. You know, that maybe we should look at fees for use of our uh, our fields. That you know, the town invests heavily in them and, and keeping them up. Uh, they're an asset. We're one of the we're not the only town that doesn't charge fees, but a lot of truck towns do. So we should at least consider it. Uh, Lisa has a proposal uh, with a fee schedule, uh, and that's going to require a little update on our uh, facility use form. And our facility use form needs an update anyway, that says, you know, it's 2010s. So, uh, how, anyway. how do we determine, just justify to ourselves? on who we're going to charge a facility use and who we do not. Um, you know, and I, I read through the proposal, it's I don't know, $125 or something for the maintaining okay. the field. Uh, and yet we don't charge anybody, any group to you, whether they're from Johnson or outside of Johnson to use our upstairs municipal office. Um, the next item you have is the uh, the bike tour, which is a private uh, money making business, and we don't charge them. I'm, I'm not really saying I'm against it or for it. I'm just saying, you know, thinking how we uh, how we sort of sl uh, slice this. Uh, the bike tour is part of your question, and in that. Um, I think they would be charged in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just that they're making this application 
before we've adopted the new standard. So you would have the option tonight of they made the application before we adopted anything. Do you accept it under the old standards as it's the last one under the existing standards, or do you want to say that you haven't approved their application, so they should be covered by the, the new standard? Um, but they're just coming in right at the end of the old one. Well, I guess I'm just throwing a question out to the whole board on, you know, how we dice this, you know, where we're going to charge and what we're going to use the justification to charge for one group, whether they're from town or not, and other areas we do not. So I think, and I'd, I'd like to hear from Lisa on this too. I imagine she had a lot to do with the drafting, um, but I'm not sure. Um, I, when I was on rec, we talked a lot about this. There would be like Cambridge Youth Soccer, which was a big soccer league. Um, and they had practices and games regularly in Legion Field. And um, that regular use was a real expense that we, that we incurred on a sort of an annual basis. And field lining can also be pretty, pretty costly. Um, so this is a, an out of town group that's collecting registration fees for regu regular use of our equipment. And there is regular wear and tear that we need to repair. Um, and so collecting modest fees in, in that situation to me makes a lot of sense um, for one off events or just pick up games of soccer that meet down there regularly. That doesn't make as much sense to me. Um, but I, I think that was kind of that has been traditionally the thinking of rec. And I don't know if Lisa, you want to elaborate. Or if you don't want to be put on the spot, it's fine too. No, no, that's fine. Um I don't have too much history with it. I know when I was on rec many years ago, we talked about it at the time and then it got shelved again. Um, having gone down to the fields recently because we had interest in someone renting them and sort of just checking them out and stuff. We do have some goal damage from just the goals being older and things like that, that we're going, if we were going to be renting them, which they are not actually following through with, um, so, you know, we can delay it a little, but we would have to, you know, do some mending of our nets and fixing of some goal posts and things like that, which of course do have costs associated with them. Um, anyone who wants to do, you know, pick up Saturday soccer or the women's group that meets, they just could do it under the heading of Johnson Rec. You know, come to me, we set it up, you know, and come to the Rec committee, get it set up, and then that would be covered as a non based use and we would then also know who was down there and what they're doing because there's it, it's sort of a free-for-all unless it's scheduled for rec so this is definitely draft one this was sent to brian as very much the preliminary first draft so open to changes you know input everything yeah i mean the, the, John, the johnson bike rental um I wouldn't want, I mean, at this point, I really would not want to charge them um, because I think they're kind of doing us a favor by being a presence down there. And I think it's a nice business for the town. So, you know, if we had 10 businesses down there that were all, you know, creating a lot of wear on the, on the property that needed to be maintained, I would have a different idea on that. So I don't know how to draft the policy that way, but that would be what I'm my thinking. Um, I actually, I spoke to Jim a little bit about this when I was writing it because I happened to run into him at the fields at the time. And he said, um, there's also another way to do it is to put a, you know, small fee associated with the permit process, you know, and so sort of maybe delineating between field use gets X fee. And then if you just want to put a permit in to use a space that's not specifically a field that gets upkeep in the same with goals and, you know, fences and benches and all that stuff, maybe they would have a different fee schedule for that of just using a small space of land or something. Yeah, but I, somebody put on the use 
fee last a, a use request last last year for a birthday party for their for their five year old daughter and a, a local person like it just doesn't make any sense to charge someone like that. So we could, we could just put a line in and then that says that like if you're a taxpayer in Johnson and you want to use it for an event, go for, you know just schedule it with us and non commercial non commercial. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the people we were looking, I think the reason this came up is the request for use by a soccer club out of Essex that's making substantial money off their players. And the person said, please let me know your field rental fees. So we were like, oh, yeah, we should really visit that idea. It's a way for revenue for keeping costs down and helping offset the stuff. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yeah, Beth's trying to speak also, and I think she's probably talked a yeah, lot about was, her rec I experience. Wanted, I wanted to give the board members first the opportunity to uh, speak to it, and then we would open it up to the public. There's a uh, Evan Patch that has raised his hand, and Beth. So and is I, there any yeah. further comment? Okay, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, um, I would point out that the property that Jim Rose occupies is is not uh, is town and village property. It's a talc mill property, I believe. And I think it's used in conjunction with the rail trail, which which we are hoping to. I'm agreeing with Nat here. We're we're hoping that uh, the two point some million and the eleven point million come in and turn that into a major economic development uh, proposal for the town. So I don't think it falls under Johnson Rec exactly. You know, I think that this is uh, this is town and village owned property. For that particular user. Yes, that that user, that one. You know that that that's you know sort of pull that one out, uh, and that that doesn't address uh, the Essex Soccer Club or Cambridge or uh, wh where you uh, how you draw a line. So I was reading through this earlier, and I actually do think oh the facility use agreement is town and village one. In the past, it is. The town and village have used the same use form, the use agreement form. But we can make updates to it, and we can also make. We you know we have a specialized form for the credit. We could create a specialized form for uh, ball fields. Uh, you know, that we have one for things like the, the soccer club that, you know, right handles. And then we've got, uh, we can have another more general form that we handle the way we use Ben. Any other board members would like to speak to this? If not, um, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, um, the fees schedule that you came up with, Lisa and the Rec Committee, is that pretty in line with fee schedules around the county? Is that pretty That one, um, again, is, is drafted, just a draft, but it's, um, it, I did half the cost of what Stowe is doing for their soccer fields. Oh, wow, okay. I think, I, I mean, I think it makes sense to, to uh, charge out of town uh, revenue collecting um, teams a fee. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, At least charge a fee uh, appropriate enough to uh, cover the cost. Right. And, uh, you know, and especially uh, as Lisa was talking about the soccer club from Essex, which is a profit driven club and uh, they could certainly afford $125 or whatever the, the yeah. fee will be. So uh, why not? It's our town uh, and we have the use of our facilities or somebody else at least they could do is pony up a little bit to cover the cost. Okay, if there's no other board members that wanna speak I would ask Brian to open it up the mic for Evan. Not bad. Okay, I'll, I'll do Evan Patch first. 
Okay, Evan. Uh, and you're okay. You're unmuted now, and then Beth will call you when you know. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. So I guess uh, my one question as a resident about this, uh, if residents can use it, they should be able to use it for free because it's paid for with tax dollars, but how much revenue are we hoping to generate here? I mean, I've only heard two clubs mentioned. If we're doing all this work for $400 a year and somebody has to manage everything, does that really make sense? Like, it, is it thousands of dollars we're taking off the tax base here or is it just a penalty for having to mark lines so that some kids from a different town can play soccer. I'm guessing it's in the hundreds, not thousands, but Lisa, can you, how, how often do we have requests? Well, I've been here um, a, almost a year now and we've had the one request and I believe Cambridge Soccer would have made a request had it not been for COVID. So it's not a tremendous amount of money. Um, and it's also, though, not a tremendous amount of management on my part either. You know, they send an email. I ask them for the insurance and fill out this permit and give them the go ahead, I think is probably, you know, about all it'll be a little bit of scheduling here and there. But Nat, you raised your hand. How? 120 bucks isn't really a, a, a ton of money, but it does go quite a ways um, just the way that REC manages those fields. So it, it um, I think it makes sense for people from out of town who are using the field to have a little uh, contribution. Okay, thank you, Evan. Did you have anything else? Uh, I, it was just an income-based thing. If we've already okay. spent town hours of more than this thing will bring in in two years, I don't really understand it, but I, I understand some fees to out of town people, but it yes. doesn't seem like it's gonna trim anything. Okay, thank you. Beth? Okay. All right, go ahead, Beth. Um, so I have a couple, a couple of comments. One is that um, I'm actually all for charging the clubs because the clubs do make money and particularly soccer doesn't have a lot of overhead. So they're in theory making quite a bit of money. Um, and I also know that those soccer goals that Lisa's talking about are really expensive. So I think that, and they're actually, by the way, have been in really bad shape since I was on rec and I'm pretty sure they haven't been replaced. And there's a couple that are probably not safe. Um, so, but all of that being said, those are really expensive. And I actually think that on top of charging the fee to those clubs, I think there should be a deposit for damage that gets returned to them after they're done using them because those goals are so expensive. Um, also, um, I actually don't think we should be, my opinion, <laughs> charging anything for the lining of the fields. I actually don't think we should be doing the lining. We have lining for our clubs and that's it. And if anyone else needs lining, that's their responsibility and it's part of whatever the contract is that's signed um, for the usage of the fields. Um, and then lastly, I just want to throw out there that um, Old Mill Park is labeled a park. So I think that we just need to be really clear on what is billable and what isn't, because I know I spent a lot of time trying to get people to the park. Um, it's a great space and we want to encourage usage of it. Um, so I just think that that's really an important piece. Um, and lastly, I would just say, um, I know that Legion Field and Old Mill Park are both specifically noted here, but um, sorry, I don't know that I have been corrected many, many, many times over the years, but Checkerberry, whatever the new name is, <laughs> uh, is also a field that, yes, it is a wet field, but I think that is in some ways um, a nice location for some events even though access to it is a little bit difficult. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to throw all of those things out there. Um, but, the, but specifically around the, the term park, um, if we're talking about this being a public park versus a, um, like when we compare to Stowe, we're talking about Stowe soccer fields or Stowe, um, they're, they're named differently, I guess is my point. They're not really called parks in the same way ours is called a park. So I just want to throw that up there for consideration. 
Okay, Brian, is there anyone else with their hand up? I don't see anybody else with their hand up. Okay. Uh, Greg, Tedro had a comment in the in chat, um, you know, that it, this can be good for local economy stores and restaurants and things. I think that's true. Um, and my, my kind yep. of answer to that is I think that the fee we're talking about for $125 for a season for use, I don't think that's going to make or break uh, their decision to come to Johnson. Our, our fields tend to be in pretty good repair. Uh, we maintain them well, and that's still going to be relative yep. compared to other options. So I guess what's before the board is this was the first draft Lisa is providing to us. Uh, does the board want to send it back for any changes or are we prepared to adopt it? I'm, I'm curious about requiring insurance and why that's necessary. I think if I remember, I was reading a couple different documents today. I believe that comes from the pre-existing. Oh, I'm trying to scroll the document, sorry. <laughs> that's from Brian's screen. Um, I believe that's the pre-existing from it is. town and villages. Yeah, number eight. That was already on there. It's already on there. It, I'm, I'm wondering is, if it's necessary. We, I think we're pretty well insured for activities in our parks. Um, I'm wondering why there's an occupancy limit too. Um, uh, the occupancy is more about we want a decent description of what they're doing um, and just how much of the park are they using. Is it, you know, sometimes it's clear from the description of the event, but is this more on the level of a child's birthday party who you know, wants to know that they've got, you know, kind of private access to a small part of our park, or is this a big event where they're going to use all of Old Mill Park? Um, Sure. I, I may, I think instead of a, um, phrasing it as a limit, maybe con consider just asking how many they expect to show up. Just a okay. suggestion along with the insurance suggestion. Um, so I would, I would want to look and, you know, suggest that those couple of th things be looked into perhaps, um, and then brought back to us, but that's just me. So if we're going to I'd like to address the insurance uh, business, uh, especially uh, toward that. Uh, it's one thing if uh, a Johnson resident uh, gets hurt on the soccer field, let's say, and then goes after the town insurance. And it's another thing if you have somebody from another town come here and then use our insurance. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with having the out of town group provide their own insurance in that way. They can take care of their own people if something happens. Uh, but like you said, that's just you, uh, that's just me. I, I think that uh, the Johnson uh, insurance umbrella is for Johnson people. And if another entity from another town uh, or a club wanted to come here, they could insure themselves. They shouldn't uh, jump on our insurance. Was also part of this wording for insurance occupancy due to the form itself as a facility use, which was more general for any town or village owned facility? And I'm asking the question, I guess, to Brian. Historically, I believe that some of, them, some of how this originated, that particular language. I also think that the insurance requirement. Um, it kind of helps the next section, section nine, where we allow that if you don't have insurance, you can say that you're going to hold the town harmless and, and verify that you are not covered by our insurance. And I think that that, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I think that that helps, that the section before it helps bank that up. So that we're, we're recommending that you you should have insurance. If you don't, you might still be able to use it, but you are not using our insurance. 
I can live with that. I just want to make it, I don't, I don't want to restrict it too much or make it too hard to use our fields. So I can live with that. No, but the next section is if you don't have attorneys. Yeah, no, you're right. That doesn't mean you can't use it. That just means you know that you don't have the service. Yep, I can, I can live with that. What that really does is that uh, if you have a uh, agency with $10,000 in the bank and you've got a $100,000 injury and we're somehow responsible because of our net broker or our soccer goal, uh, if you have a hold harmless and they don't have any assets, you won't get any money out of them, any contribution. So I think Lisa and I have some comments that the board would like to see uh, that we can work on incorporating for the next uh, the next review. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. A lot of work. Good work. Yeah. Excellent job with that, Lisa. Back to the draft two coming at you. <laughs> I do like I do like Beth's comment about really being very clear between the fields and the park. I think that's a really important distinction. Okay. Next up, uh, Memorial Valley Bank Corps has a facility use request. This is uh, very similar to the use request that they've made in the past, uh, but it has a couple changes. Uh, let's see. The, they want an additional day of operation, which I believe is, uh, I think Wednesday. Jim Harlan, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, Jim, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, but it's a, a one additional day of operation, which I believe is Wednesday, and uh, it's a request to leave the bike trailer on site overnight. And Jim is here and I've unmuted him so we have any questions for Hi folks, I am here. Hey, hey Jim. Jim. How, how is everybody? Great. Good. Excellent. Thanks for coming back. You're looking yeah. at four days of operation, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the request is to leave your, your uh, trailer there overnight, which is different from the prior. That's correct. I think we had the same operating days last year um, and we have fluctuated. Um, but yeah, the, the ask about the trailer, uh, again, it's an ask um, for us. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of efficiencies involved with um, transporting uh, the bikes back and forth every day. And um, it was something we had um, thought about in the past, um, but haven't you know, our needs haven't really led us to that, but, um, you know, we, we are, um, well, pre COVID, uh, certainly uh, planning uh, a lot. We've experienced some growth and, um, just as we adapt to that, um, as Brian knows, I've been talking with him about this space, just trying, uh, to hard plumb a little bit more, uh, to the recreational area down there. We're, you know, all about um, tourism in that area, uh, recreation in that area, um, all about the railroad street area wide plan. Um, so we've, you know, we tossed around a couple other ideas as well. Um, you know, Brian and I have been discussing the mill building and some uh, opportunities there. Um, looking at some private space with uh, the Parker and Stearns folks, but you know, we, uh, our current status right now, um, and our needs are, are um, as identified in that permit there. I'm um, just looking for uh, four days a week. I think most folks are aware of our operation. I'm happy to go into detail if not, but um, the ask about the trailer would, would, uh, would certainly be a help um, on our end. What's Boar's thought? Jim, are you thinking the trailer would be, would you leave it on where you set up, like on the lawn there by the, um, by the building, by the food shelf building? 
Yes, we're focused on what I'm calling the mill building lawn. Yes, yeah. and that, yeah. that area there. Yeah. And we're flexible. And, and in all of this conversation, you know, they're, we're certainly open to thoughts. So I think your presence down there is really beneficial for us. It, it uh, just keeps a presence down there. Somebody who's, who's there keeping an eye on stuff. Right? It's also just a really great business. So motion to approve. Yeah, second. We have a motion to approve and second with no conditions or changes. Any discussion? And your trailer right. request is in the is in there, right, Jim? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, yes. Great. My question is, how how are you, how is he planning to secure the trailer so it isn't like uh, ECI or whoever, where somebody backed up, hooked onto it, and drove away with their <laughs> trailer? <laughs> I mean, We've got some. Yeah. We've I'm got some thoughts. This proposal, but. Yep. No, duly noted. Security is one of our um, w one of our concerns. There, um, we we'd like it not to be, but um, uh, certainly with having that down there, um, you know, one thought is we'd love to uh, perhaps build a little uh, platform that would surround the tongue and ball of the the trailer, um, and you know, we could use it for increased signage or something like that, but. Um, in a way, our thought is to be able to secure that so that access to that would be um, limited. Uh, we do have a lock. It's the, the ball itself is, is locked uh, with a dead bolt or, or, or lock um, every day, even as it is. But um, yeah, I mean, th that concern there, Doug, is, is something that we've talked about uh, quite a bit, so. Okay. Doug, that's his problem, not ours. <laughs> Any other discussion? As long as you're well insured, Jim, that's... Uh... <laughs> we are. <laughs> and, and Jim, were you able to talk to uh, uh, Troy from the village about... Uh, uh... Uh, that is still something that I would love to follow up on um, pending the results of this conversation tonight. And I guess... I... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead certainly want to have him on board. I mean, we've, we've certainly uh, enjoyed working, um, you know, with, with all the mixed uses down there. And, and uh, in short, we just, you know, we want to maintain those relationships. So happy to, happy to chat with um, anyone that, that need be. Is, is there going to be a village sign off on this? I had reached out to Meredith with the, with the same request. Um, and I, I had not heard back and might look for some input into how yeah, best to navigate approval there. That's shared property. So they would have to give the bless as well. And I'm sure there won't be any problems, but. When did you put that request in Jim with Meredith? Uh, it wasn't too, it was previous to this meeting, so um, I, I can follow up with her. Yeah, you should. Yeah. yeah. And Kyle, you had something you wanted? That was actually, that was actually my question. Okay. You talked to the village yet. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to have Kate be there if you need, Jim, but I, I think she'll uh, probably work with you, get back to you. So give me a call if she doesn't, I guess. I will. Thank Any you for that. Yep. Anyone else? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Have a good season, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, good luck. Hey, thank you all. Thanks so much. We'll see you this season. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Have a great night. Good night. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, we've got the study and pre-approval of autonomous vehicle test. It's uh, hard to hear you, Brian. Say again? Hard to hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, the next topic up is the study and pre-approval of autonomous vehicle test. Uh, there's a very lengthy guide on this available on the website that they didn't include in your packet just because it uh, wasted my paper. Well, and I, it was over the limit. The file size limit on what I can email on the people I'm trying to pass it all together. 
Um, but the kind of short version for this is we're, all we're agreeing to right now is that we are inviting the discussion, that we would be willing to talk about it. Um, I think that this, I, I would take this pretty enthusiastically uh, as an endorsement. I think this could be really good for us. I think it could be really good for some of our institutions. Um, you know, the, the college might be able to find some partnership opportunities here. They mentioned in a briefing that I attended that uh, college campuses and rural towns were some of the sites that they were interested in finding. Um, what exactly do they do? They will be, uh, I mean, they're going to be working on setting up kind of controlled environments where they're going to run a car, uh, especially during testing, they'll have a driver in the car, but the car system will be operating the car. I'm going to volunteer, Eric. You're, you are? <laughs> oh, sure. I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. So this is driverless cars? Yep. Huh. Yeah, definitely. Let's do it. Yeah. You got to get right on this. We don't want to lose this. Nope. Uh, so why don't we, if I can make a kind of twofold suggestion for this, Let's invite the representatives from v trans to come and talk to the board and make a presentation on this so we can kind of keep the conversation going. But if we're comfortable with it, uh, I can put in our pre-approval immediately. So move. We got a motion to approve. What are we exactly approving? Allowing the testing or endorsing it or supporting it? At, at this point, what we're committing to is that we are interested. We're interested. That we're okay. we're comfortable. We're we're endorsing the idea that they are going to count so us we, among the places that might do. So we probably can do this by consensus and not a formal vote. Okay. Yeah, and, and I guess is there any board members who have reservations about it? If not, I would say, Brian, go forward. Okay. Um, that was a quick one. Yeah. Um, I, I spoke to the college briefly, and they're very interested in, in this also. So, good. So I bring them up as a, uh, uh, a partner in this. All right. Next up is the draft building ordinance. So I made a few changes based on our discussion. Did uh, you talk, uh, show this to the assessors? Uh, parts of it. I was not able to go in detail with them, but uh, I've got a few comments from them. Like they gave me the uh, 100 square feet, anything below that, they're probably not interested. Okay. And they had one or two other comments, but uh, no major comments or for changes. No. Okay. Uh, so our purpose, I think I captured what we were describing in that, you know, that this is both a recognition of our responsibilities, um, but it's also about equity and fairness and property tax assessment and payment. That that's really our driving force is that uh, we're not assessing people universally fairly uh, because we're making people who have more visible homes are getting reassessed and uh, having their property values affected more often. Uh, and it's just a, a, a fact of it if we're Doing it, doing the assessment kind of haphazardly as we learn about them or hear about them. Um, and that's that's the motivation behind it. So when we get into detail, 
No, I did not strike out the, I left some of my commentary language in here that we were interested in something for commercial, but it didn't sound like we really came to any agreement on that, striking that language. Uh, so that's item three from uh, permit required section. The exemptions from permit, uh, freestanding buildings of less than 100 square feet. That was a suggestion from our discussion and it was backed up by the listers. Hi, I'm sorry, could you scroll down as you're talking so we yeah. see the visual? Thanks. So there's item three, that's struck. Thank you. Freestanding buildings of less than 100 square feet, that's new, that's based on our conversations uh, here and with the listers. Uh, they, we said we were in, interested in finding out what was the threshold, if, if it's below this, they're just not interested. And they said the same thing that was suggested of uh, 100 square feet. Uh, I thought about adding something about no utilities or something like that here, but uh, I left it off. I just left it as a freestanding building of less than 100 square feet. And you know, it's a shed, you know, basic shed, small shed. You know, again, we talked about a tree house, something like that, I think would qualify into this. Um, yeah, so thing, there, there's now a threshold where if it's smaller than this, it's not gonna affect the property of your home or the property value of your home. If it doesn't affect the value of your home, we're not in. Yeah. Uh, I, did, I made no changes to the enforcement or the administration and the application side. So that is kind of where we stand. Um, so I've gotten some, can I jump in now? Yes, please. I've gotten some feedback from some folks in, in town who are interested and in, in concerned about it. Um, and I think they helped sort of uh, focus my thinking on this. Um, going back to the purpose, um, I think you put it really well here the town needs to be aware of building renovations and um, require the town to find all changes and assessments without any assistance from property owners is inefficient and it results in increased assessments, punishing residents with visible structures. That I think is right on the money. Um, I get, cons I'm concerned about the language of recognizing and managing right of ways of stormwater public utilities. I think that wasn't really our original intention here. And I know that we've kind of gone, we, we did discuss that in previous meetings, but I'm not really excited about that. I, I, I'd rather that not be in there. So the two things, that's the main goal is the, for me is, is tax equity and fairness. The second goal is really safety of the assessors so that they have contact information of the property owner before they go up um, into the boondocks and just knock on somebody's door unannounced, which can be a dangerous situation. And it can also be um, uh, invasive to the property owner. So I think out of fairness to, to both parties. Um, so I'm hoping we can kind of make this a little bit simpler in erring on the side of simplicity. And I'd also like to really be explicit in the document that um, this ordinance is not to be used to deny the building of anything on someone's, um, on someone's private land. That this is, um, this is for a property owner to inform us of a potential assessment change, but it's not, it's not a permit that can be denied by us. That if it's gonna be denied, it's denied for some other reason, back to 50, lack of sewer access, whatever. But this is not a zoning document that we are allowed to, we're not gonna be able to use this ordinance to deny somebody from building something. 
those are my initial thoughts and I've got some more specific sort of language. But I'll stop talking because I've been talking for a little while. I think, well, I think that really gets at well, it gets at our purpose. It gets at what we wanted this to do. Thank you. Ryan, um, those are great comments. Now, remind me why we had that first sentence. Uh, the first sentence was based on some of our discussions, and we were talking about, um, you know, uh, we were talking about possibly adding a spec in, in here about, um, you know, did you get Act 250 approval? You know, was Act 250 necessary for the project? We were interested in. It was going to be informational, but it was going to be collecting a little bit of information for the purpose of, um, you know, managing the public rights of way and public utility. Uh, it was not. Th there's never been any intention about having. A, a, uh, approving or denying it ourselves, but there was a desire of, you know, wouldn't this, wouldn't it be helpful if we knew a little bit more about what we're going um, But that gets beyond uh, knowing what their process is with environmental review and um, Act 250 and everything else that doesn't directly have an impact on their assessed value. Right. Yeah. I so I agree that that should be struck. Yeah. Yeah, we can strike that and and retain our core purpose uh, easily. Yeah. I don't know why you would strike that when you, we have a program that uh, uh, where people have to get permits for town highway access and town highway access are. Are are uh, are really important, and having people build things without getting uh, uh, an access permit is, is a potential problem. I think that uh, we would want to give people information that that we are seeking to. Maybe it's not managing public rights away, but it's it's uh, you know, we are uh, concerned with. We have a duty to man to. Uh, be, to issue permits for town highway access. And, uh, and they all have culverts and stuff. So I, I think that maybe you don't call it managing public height rights away, but I think that uh, in recognize our responsibility with regard to access to town highways. Uh, my, I, in, in the permit administration and application section, I would take out in paragraph two, where we're talking about information on size and location of the project, the existing regulatory permits. I take all of that out. I would just say we want a uh, questions concerning the name, address, contact information, and general description of the project. Period. That covers what we're what we're interested. In, I think, and I don't think we really want to to pass on the permits when they say, "Well, we told you had this permit or that." I don't think we want to. We really want to know, and I don't think in number three we'd want to know. The location of utilities, wells, septic replacement, septic areas, et cetera. Those things, I think, are beyond the scale of the information or the highway access. Yes, I, I agree with Doug. That gets beyond the intent of what we're looking to accomplish with this. All we're looking for is to be aware of a structure being built for the assessment purposes. All right, so I've struck that language uh, in permit in permit administration and application. I'll take the scroll down there. Mr. Chairman? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, this started out kind of simple in the beginning, but somehow it's uh, morphed into some kind of a complicated document. Uh, I think we ought to run this by the Planning Commission and see what they think about it. Let them have a little discussion on it. That's not going to simplify anything. 
<laughs> I think we can keep this really simple. And I think my, I, and I agree with you, I, that we do want it to be simpler than it is right now. I think we can work on it to, to keep, to get it simple here. We should be able to make this as simple as a curb cut permit. Yeah. Uh, this, this should be a lot easier than the curb cut permit. Um, so the rest of the board doesn't think the uh, planning commission ought to have a look at this then. I don't think they want to attend the burial. What's that? Doug? I said I don't think the planning commission wants to attend the burial. That's what will happen when it goes there. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> I think that might be his goal. So, so you want to clean up a copy and we'll look at it again next meeting? Yeah, I, I, especially with this, I'm just making cuts. Um, yeah. I, I can easily have this ready for our next meeting. Okay. Um, we're looking, we're looking, I'd like to remove language about creating a sketch. I don't think that's necessary. No, a general description like uh, Doug mentioned would okay, be plenty. So so you're thinking that item three under permit administration application, strike that whole uh, strike, number, strike number three. I mean, maybe, and to Doug's point, you know, maybe having uh, some sort of information with this that says, these are some other things that you need to consider. Like we already, if you might already need a, um, a curb cut application, or you might you might you might need approval for all of these other things, but this isn't where you do that. Um, I'd like to um, suggest for number five that we don't establish fees, so that we we say explicitly no fees, and that this is really not an application so much as it is just notification that the landowner is is doing something that's changing their assessed value, potentially. I would be fine with taking five out. It's kind of the camel's nose under the tent. Okay. I'm sorry, can five then? Uh, I'm going to combine two and three uh, and mostly eliminate them, which is just, you know, change that from a sketch to just a general description of the project. Yeah, I mean, really, just so that the assessor knows, like, either I need to call this person and ask a couple of follow up questions. Or I need to do a site visit at some point to, to, to fix it up. You don't need detailed information about. Yeah. Yeah. The most important thing we need is the contact info and the address location. Yeah. So we're going to be down to name, address, contact information, the owners, and project description. And that's yeah. it. Uh, so that also means on the application. I'm striking uh, prior permits. Yes. Uh, do you want me to strike these three, the new construction, renovation, or addition? If it helps the assessors to figure, to yeah, know I, know. Then leave I think the general description will probably tell us what it's, if it's an addition or new construction when right. they submit that. Either way. Yeah. I think leaving in leaving in renovation or new construction, a renovation might indicate to a person, oh, I'm planning to do this. You know, uh, I guess I will have to submit this. You know, they it may trigger it may the specificity may help the person with the application. I could put them kind of above the project description. We might think of them as kind of writing prompts or making a description. 
Mm -hmm. Or I could change them to actual writing prompts. So I could do, you know, project description. Then, you know, for example, is this a new construction, renovation, or an addition? As long as they don't think that they can check a box and not actually write out a description. Yeah. So I'll take another crack at the form too, but yeah, I'll, I'll simplify that. Mike, do you think we're heading in a good direction here, or do you think it's still too much? Did you ask me a question? Do you think it's uh, we're heading in a good direction, or do you still think it's too much? I guess uh, you're headed in a good direction if you agree with the whole thing. Uh, I still think it is a little bit of a kind of a backdoor zoning myself, but I'm only one board member. So, Brian, I'm seeing a hand up if there's yeah. a good opportunity here to let public speak. All right, Diana, I'm unmuting you. Okay, go ahead, Diana. Okay, um, the only comment I had was about the 10 by 10 structure. Yep. Um, that it, my recommendation would be to align it with whatever the assessors use as the type of structure for which they make an assessment, rather than just picking an arbitrary dimension. Is there actually something in the information that assessors use to determine which outbuildings are assessed and which aren't? That is how we arrived at the 100 square feet. That okay, cool. They say that that's, that size and under, they're not interested. It's not going to affect the value of your home. So, if my chicken coop is bigger than 100 square feet, am I assessed on that? I suppose you you could be. Um, I don't know how that would affect. I'm not, not familiar enough with the assessment formula, but they would at least want to. That would be the kind of thing that they want to know. About. Uh, but uh, how it affects you is that's a lot more specific of an assessor question than I can answer. Okay, thanks. Uh, Evan's also got his hand up. Okay. Evan. Uh, okay, go ahead, Evan. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Somehow I lost visual. But that happens. Um, I mean, I'm assuming that a lot of this came about because of the property at Lock Mill Lane. Um, but regardless how it came about or not, with the whole COVID thing, and most people can't make it to these select board meetings, not that a ton of people go anyways, but some people don't have access to the internet and some people aren't willing to deal with the internet. Why shouldn't this be shelved until we're done with this whole COVID thing so people can actually tell you? If this is something they want or not. I believe we might done them wholeheartedly. This is backdoor zoning, and I don't see how people should need to tell the town what's happening on their property. The tax system's already not fair. Yeah, let me address that a little bit, Evan. This actually is a request that came to us from our assessors. And one of the big difference between I can't really uh, see the thing. assessors and what we had prior with listers is the listers would go to every single residence place in the town every single year and they would basically see if anything had been done and then they would uh, make those assessment changes to the, the property. But the assessors uh, were paying them a little bit differently and ex our expectations were a little different with them in that they're going and doing a full assessment, a, a rolling uh, reappraisal of a quarter of the town every year and then at the end of four years there's a, a town-wide reappraisal that's uh, sent out uh, so they're not catching every property every year and without any zoning or anything like that in the town of Johnson uh, they're having a lot of troubles trying to keep up with people that you know somebody could build a, a mega mansion and uh, they just wouldn't even be aware of it. And as an equity issue for all if taxpayers. Somebody built, if somebody built a mansion, one of you five would know it. 
yeah, I'm I'm exaggerating here, but if if somebody built a barn or uh, added onto their house, there's a good chance that the assessors, especially if it's back off from the road, uh, the assessors would not be aware of it. If it's somebody that's right up near the road, yes, they'll they'll find out about it because there'll be enough people that see it. So it's more of an equity issue for all the taxpayers. That still didn't answer the initial question about because of how I feel. Um, Mike Dunham put it well, I think, backdoor zoning. With it being this big of an item, why can this not be shelved until COVID is done? That way taxpayers can actually come in and speak their mind. But we actually started this well before the COVID. Um, this was a request that originally came to us from the assessors a year ago, and we've just been moving along slowly. You know, th this is not gonna get approved tonight. You know, there's some more draft work. Uh, there's gonna be plenty of times for opportunity for people to, uh, to look at it. If the town, uh, the select board decides to uh, adopt it, it, th it then has to be posted and there will be an opportunity for voters to draw up a petition to require a town-wide vote. It, this is no different than any other ordinance that we worked on. Eric? Yes, go Matt, ahead. Matt, why don't you go ahead? Oh, to, to me, zoning is a process by which a, a municipality can can deny you a permit, can say you can't do what you want to do, what you want to build. This, I, I think we need to be very explicit. We're not approving or denying anything. Um, we're just getting the information. But, but you're getting something in the door. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I know. I know zoning takes a lot more, but we're already having to go down for permits. What's the penalty for not getting a permit? A fine. Huh? A fine. Oh. Yeah, there would there would be a I, fine if you didn't get it, but there's no fee for the permit. There's no approval or denial process for the permit. It's just an informational. So great, I go and get my floor sanded, and because I didn't go get your tell you guys that I did that and it supposedly increased the value of my house, now I get to pay a fine. I don't think that that's, I don't think that sanding the floor falls within any of the definitions. And, you know, with regard to the, with regard to the COVID, I'd point out that we have 25 participants today, which is more than we've had in almost any meeting. So COVID is actually increasing the number. I think that's uh, the comic is just a way of burying it again, you know? Yeah, uh, maybe. I mean, I know a lot of my family members are not tech savvy. Yeah, I think what Doug's getting at is a lot of people may not be tech savvy, but they weren't coming to the board members either. Uh, meetings, we, uh, this is way more participants than we usually have in our regular meetings. Um, can we call on Beth and Manuel? Uh, we'll skip that. Just add it. Thanks, Evan. All right. Beth, go um, ahead. So Evan actually touched on a little bit, almost touched on my question, which was, I'm not really sure what all boundaries are, um, because one of the lines talks about increasing your property value. By the way, I also don't like the idea of this leading to something more that I'm not, I'm fully supportive that's not the intent but i think it is a step but um i am also very much for equity because when i look at the report the assessed reports and i look at all the different property values i see some inequities there um so that's my first comment so i'm i'm supportive for that reason um but when i look at like the definitions that are out there i really don't know where the line is um, if you, my mom, you know, my mother paints for a living. If she goes through and paints someone's house, every single room in their house, th that house is going to look a lot nicer and in theory is more resellable than it would have been before she painted. But I don't think that's the intent of what you're looking for. So like, how do we know where those boundaries are and are not based on what's here? Because I'm not really seeing it. Um, there's a talk about whether you increase your square footage and there's talk about whether you increase bedrooms and there's talk about 
um, converting the use to a um, residential versus commercial use? Are those the three requirements or is it more than that? Well, I would just add, uh, say the one thing that you mentioned, Beth, that this this would not be have an intent, nor is it anywhere spelled out for general maintenance items. So if you uh, painted all every room in your house, yes, the, the making it uh, sellable is a lot, it increases that, but it doesn't increase the assessed value. Um, if they, you know, if you put on a new roof, that's normal maintenance, of your maintaining your building. If you add on a room and it's uh, over 100 square feet, that would be something that would increase your assessed value and we'd want to know about it. Well, if, or if vice we're doing, if we're having assessors come in and they're seeing <laughs> my kitchen right now, 19 late 80s style uh, versus me renovating my kitchen, I mean, that's a $10,000, $15,000 difference in my house value. So like, True. where is that line? But the way the assessors do it is, uh, and, and believe me, there is a lot, it's a lot more complicated than what I can really talk to, but uh, is they look at the number of, uh, you know, faucets.